Okay, hopefully I'm coming out live. Uh, let me just check before I start chatting away. It's always good to check the technical bit. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> before we come out live. Hopefully Di will be joining me shortly. Oh, excuse me. Uh, let's have a quick look. Yeah, excellent. So I should be coming out live. Welcome to today's live talking about puppy biting and also ooh, sleeping patterns. So um, Di's going to be joining me hopefully shortly, fingers crossed. Um, she's had some things come up, so um, she should be with us shortly. But I'm going to start talking about the importance of puppy uh, sleep, sleep patterns, and also um, puppy biting, which are two really, really common issues lots of people have. Let me just pop that down there, um, which um, often can be the precursor or the um, underlying issue with um, dogs having challenges, as certainly with puppies. So firstly, those of you that have shown interest in the Ultimate Puppy Course, thank you very much for your interest. The puppy course is still open. I'm going to type the information um let me just put that in there in the thread uh bear with me uh there so anybody wants to sign up for the ultimate puppy course now is your chance it's going to be open indefinitely but obviously if you have a puppy had a puppy thinking about getting a puppy right um it's really important um to get those foundation right and the ultimate puppy course is most definitely the um but in my opinion, it's the best uh, course. Obviously, I would say that, but certainly um, it is so comprehensive. There is so much information. You cannot go wrong if you uh, subscribe to it and, and access the content. So we're really excited to share it with you. Hopefully, um, you're going to gain if, when you become part of that. Um, and today and this all this week, we've been doing lives to talk about things, pressing issues that puppy owners are often concerned with and today we're focusing on sleep patterns and puppies biting so first off the both of the things the reason that we've talked about them or we chose to put them together is because they're interlinked so puppy biting is a really really common issue and the amount of people that have issues with puppies biting them and panic about it and they you know um people even rehome their dogs because of it they um get really really stuck at the puppy biting stage first thing to assure you is that puppies biting is a very very normal thing for them to happen and it's really really um really something that will definitely pass if you handle it correctly in those early stages but as in this is again where it's an interlinked conversation often it can be related to the puppy getting insufficient sleep and that's something that um we're going to obviously be elaborating on so the two things are interlinked as i said earlier so first off we want to make sure that the reason the puppy is is biting or biting excessively isn't because the puppy is overtired so often people when they get their puppies home they want to integrate them into their life excuse me <coughs> and they want to um let them experience oh Di's just joining just bear with me whilst I die. hello Di hello there sorry I'm just running from a lesson that's all right so um we're just talking about puppy biting and obviously sleep patterns so as I was saying um sleep patterns is something that people often underestimate and and I cannot uh, emphasize now how important it is to make sure that your puppy gets sleep and as a result of that one of the classic things that they can often show is biting and biting excessively so you know you always find puppies get to a certain point in the day and they get into that witching hour where they are a little bit more tetchy they're a little bit more bitey a little bit more hyperactive you'll normally find that's an indicator that they need sleep and they're going to need a rest and that can happen throughout the day so puppies that bite excessively it could simply be that they're tired and they're not getting enough rest people grossly underestimate how much sleep a puppy needs puppies need between 16 and 18 hours a day of sleep in their generally speaking um and obviously that's going to including the time that they have at night so that might be anything from you know six to eight hours possibly depending on the puppy slightly more um and also intermittent sleep throughout the day so that means um space where the puppy can have really good deep rest and not be interrupted by the comings and goings of the household so it's really really important that 
you create a safe space for the puppy where they're secluded from the busyness of the household so they can have quiet time and that you're learning about your puppy when you get them home to find out the natural rhythm of when your puppy needs a rest. Obviously, if you have that conversation with the breeder before you get them, it's easier because you can um, uh, follow the pattern that the breeder has established. If not, as quick as you can, get them into some sort of routine. So sleep patterns, Di, any thoughts? Well, just what you just said there, really, just try and get remember their learning in kind of patterns. So I think definitely if you have uh, a pattern in place, it makes it easier and kind of stick to that pattern, really. Um, you know, I've got a little boy staying with me for residential at the minute um, and he's very much into his pattern now. And I usually do. They just get nice asleep. He's calmed down. Um, you know, some people may have not established that pattern and it can it can take a while um, and just, you know, stick with it. And I think just be careful not to create any triggers for separation in the crate. I, I must admit, I don't, I don't leave the room when my puppies are having their nap time for the first couple of weeks. And I do work on, um, you know, habituating them to the kind of everyday kind of noises that might mean I'm leaving. So if my puppy was in the crate next to me here, which is typically where they'd be, you know, I'm going to do a chair wobble or I'm going to stand up and, you know, the wheels will make a noise and I'll sit down again. And at the corner of my eye, I'm just looking, you know, the puppy wake up and think I was going somewhere and is a bit alarmed by that noise or, uh, you know, and I'm doing those kind of things until they kind of sleep through it and just stop worrying about it. You know, I might get up and open the door and then close the door and then sit back down. Um, and again, I'm just looking in the background. What did puppy do? Um, and I'm trying to get to the point where puppy doesn't open his eyes with any of that, because, you know, I'm not going to leave the room until they're, they're perfectly settled and quite relaxed and have got used to all those noises, yeah. not being an indicator that mum's leaving the room. Yeah. And that obviously was something that takes a little bit of work and takes a bit of time. Obviously, you need to be thinking about that in your routine. So um, think about when you get your puppy home, having a, you know, a couple of days or ideally a little bit of probably about a week so you can settle them in into your routine. Simple things that you can do. So if you're going to make a beverage, put it in a um, uh, a a mug that has a lid on it so that it's warm so that way you you know if you are staying in that location for the puppy sleeping you and you want to um uh get a drink you've got one there simple things like that avoids the puppy being left uh, um, when you're you don't want to when it's just about settling you think oh i could really do with a drink and then you have to leave them and that can upset simple things like that you can often cover the crate that's a great way to um to help them um again be darker especially depending on the room that you've got them in that's another simple thing that you can do cover the crate so they're more secluded think about the space that you've got them in or you know put them in the corner create a bit of a, um, a visual barrier and that can help them get into deep sleep so uh, I often will <clears throat> if I'm at home and the weather's appropriate um, because my puppies will get used to my vehicle and my vehicle is um, created out specifically for my dogs uh, I will so often put the puppy in, in, in my van on the drive it's literally you know outside the door so I can see it so I know I'm safe Again, that's um, uh, dependent on your environment. Um, and I'll often put a puppy out there. Say, for example, if I'm pottering in the garden, I can put the puppy out there, leave the gate open. I can see what it's doing or I can hear it at least. Um, things like that are great little um, tips that you can do to think about getting your puppy in that routine. As a result of dogs, puppies, I should say, with insufficient sleep, a classic thing that you will see is puppy biting. And that's a real strong correlation between an overtired puppy and they get bitey. Um, so let's let's go through some things that you can do to deal with puppy biting. Obviously, sleep patterns is one. Di, any other ideas or thoughts about what you can do when your puppy's biting you? I think with about, you know, puppies are going to explore everything with their mouths, you know, just like a kind of baby does, really. Um, and, you know, typically, if say if I've got a puppy on my lap and he is chewing my finger, I'm just I am going to manage my hands very well to keep them out of their mouth. You know, I'm going to have a toy nearby or a chew nearby that I can give them as an alternative. You know, if it was to carry on, obviously, I'm questioning, you know, are they tired? If I've just had them out of the crate for 10 minutes, then I'm just going to try and change the environment. Let's go and get some different things for you to do. So I'm certainly not going to leave puppy there chewing me. I'm going to pop them on the floor. Hopefully, we're going to go around exploring. You know, we can get a few toys out. We can get a few cardboard boxes out. Let's get them into some other learning and kind of focus their attention away from what they were doing. Um, and certainly just not drawing too much attention to it. So I think the more people kind of try things like, ow, and don't, and no, and it's kind of drawing attention, and then that creates a level of anxiety 
kind of in the dog and I think and then you're just going to get a little bit more biting so I think dealing with it in a very kind of passive way <coughs> and trying to kind of refocus their attention onto other things and I like to teach my puppies and this is all in in, in the course of what I call different stations so a station to me is going to a location to do things you know you can have calm stations that you might use in kitchen manners or where you're having your dinner um, or maybe you know you might send them to a station when you're answering the door eventually at a later stage but I also have stations that you know and you know you know most of you will know that your dogs are going to learn in patterns very well so if you wanted to teach something like you know let's go to the biscuit jar you know and you've got a biscuit jar in the cupboard and then you'd go to the cupboard and open the jar and give them a biscuit um so there's different things i would do there but it's about being ahead of the game what i don't want to do is puppy comes over starts biting my ankles and i go oh, let's go to the biscuit jar because yeah. if i keep using the same pattern OK, the dog's going to learn, well, if I bite your ankles, you're going to take me to the biscuit jar. So you're trying to kind of spot that kind of body language, almost that intent and be ahead of the game um, before it's happening and kind of using those phrases to redirect. Mine no kind of let's go in the garden or let's do this and let's do that. So there's lots of different phrases which we will go through more in, in the course that you can teach. So I think redirection definitely onto other activities, but being ahead of the game so it's not a reinforcer. Yeah, absolutely. And and you can, you know, as I mentioned, <coughs> you can redirect them, excuse me, <coughs> with other activities or using an item in the house. You want to be making sure that you're not conditioned them to um, that that's a reinforcement process. So think about patterns and pictures, definitely. And sometimes, to be honest, puppies lose interest really, really quickly. So just distract them away from um, um, the issue or just simply getting up and maneuvering your body so they can't bite you is a great way to deter them from uh, performing that or repeating that. So, you know, I've got dogs that are predisposed to biting, you know, my Malinois, my Malinois and my Schnauts were very, very bitey as puppies. Um, and I and I used the techniques as outlined in the puppy course to deal with it. I, I didn't want to, um, you know, be confrontational about it. I don't, I wouldn't do that with the puppy anyway, because that's going to affect my relationship. And also, you know, I want to use that desire to bite and tug things later on in their training to build up their play. So I don't want to inhibit their desire to grab things and tug with it um, by using any form of punishment or correction or, uh, uh, or no. Um, but using uh, alternative reinforcement, providing things that they can chew. Often puppies, if they realize that there's no, um, it's not gratifying to chew on you and the other old to bite you and to bite a, a bone or a chew or some sort of um, toy, um, then it is getting reinforced and you can praise them, interact with them. That what you can do is transfer the dog's natural desire of tugging and having things in their mouth onto new things. Um, any other tips that people can do with puppy biting, Di? Yeah, I think actually just look at your individual puppy and, and does it actually, you know, it's not every puppy is going to like being touched, you know. You could have got a puppy and it's been visited by lots of families. Maybe it's been picked up by children and children would have a habit of seeing that puppy doing something cute. And I run in and pick that one up and oh, that one's doing something cute. Let's put that one down quick. You know, and, and kind of being a little bit of mishandling in there. And maybe you've got a little bit of mishandling as well from your own children. Or maybe you've been taking things off a of puppy. OK, so hands coming towards maybe a potential negative. So I think I'd be looking out for that and I'd definitely be doing some more kind of operant training on you know hands coming towards you are positive me approaching is positive you know doing some approach and feed exercises um or i might just you know show them a hand coming towards them and mark and feed and then i'd build up to can i touch you mark and feed some of you kind of i, I teach you what i call a safe mat handling so we do it just we teach them to stand on a little it's not a raised platform it's just a bit of rubber kind of ready for the grooming table if you like and we just teach a stand and feed and throw one off and we do a little game to start with and i do it up against a wall and that way we've got some confidence building with narrow spaces that dogs can be nervous of so it's a little feed 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 on the mat throw feed 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 on the mat throw and then we're going to freeze you in a stand and feed you and then as i'm feeding them i might wiggle my hand but it's not touching them just ignore this hand and then I go on to touch mark and feed um so I think some dogs need a little bit more time to enjoy that kind of physical contact than other dogs do um and just watching you know what are your hands doing in everyday situations are you forming a negative emotion about your hands approaching is that why you're getting the kind of mouthing is puppy being over picked up by the children and now now it's you know, got some negative emotions. And I think the way I like to explain it is your green always need to outweigh your red. 
Okay, so if I, you know, if the puppies usually picked up by the children a little bit, might not be seen as a, a, you know, green to the puppy. Those might be red scenarios. Maybe you pick it up to pop it in a crate. You pick it up to barf it. You pick it up to stop it doing things. You pick it up to bring it in from the garden. And you've got all these red, 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 reds. You know, what are your green kind of pickups? Yeah, do we just pick it up and give it some nice little treats and gently put it back down? Um, you know, that might be a green for some dogs. It, you know, it might be a red for other dogs. So it's looking at your individual puppy. And are your greens outweighing your reds? Otherwise, you're going to cause an effect. And potentially there's some mishandling happening but in your daily handling of the dog that is causing some of the biting. Yeah. Uh, the thing to say about puppies and puppy rearing, what the ultimate puppy course outlines is the best practice for raising a puppy that you know gives you the most likelihood of that puppy growing up to be a confident well-adjusted family pet now you can choose to train your puppy uh, alternatively uh, and you know many people raise dogs across the world successfully without um you know following the systems and and the processes that we've outlined in the puppy course However, <clears throat> that's probably down to a little bit of luck rather than judgment. And you get a lot of dogs that are super robust. You know, if you've got a little showbred Labrador, super tactile, really gregarious, an outgoing little puppy, they will probably <clears throat> navigate the ups and downs of daily life and the good and bad and poor handling on all the variations with little fallout from that. If you've got a more sensitive breed of dog, for example, like, a, a Sheltie or one of your toy breeds that are a little bit more sensitive, a little bit more, um, uh, there's a more of a finer line to be walked with them. If you have a instance where somebody grabs them up and handles them inappropriately with even with good intentions, does something to affect that puppy's confidence in that former stages, you're going to be doing damage limitation for the rest of that dog's life. What the ultimate puppy course does is it gives you the best practice that's going to give you a strong a chance of the puppy growing to being a well-adjusted family pet. And also it's tailor-made so that you can adapt it to your individual dog. So if your puppy is successful at a particular lesson, move it on, move on to the next part of the process so that you're going to go through it a lot quicker. But if your puppy needs a little bit more time spent on a specific exercise, <coughs> excuse me, you'll absolutely do that. So it is absolutely about the individual dog. Any thoughts, Di, about that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's down to the individual dog. And I think, you know, if you have got a particular bitey puppy, look at some of that history. Um, you know, you may have accidentally reinforced it. You know, puppy bites my feet. Oh, I've been told to grab a toy and play with it. So, you know, then puppy's looking for that kind of play. And in some situations, you know, I've had my clients kind of wear wellies in the house to kind of undo that reinforcement. So, you no longer kind of, you know, get reinforcement for kind of chasing my ankles and biting at my ankles. But again, trying to educate them to kind of stay ahead of the puppy, use your redirection, making sure, you know, when they are awake, you've got some good learning for them to do. And also, I think teaching some self-entertainment. You know, I yeah. sit down with my puppies a lot and teach them how to use a lot of treat-based kind of toys. You know, they're not going to be, I can't just give them, you know, say I've got a Kong and you're stuffing a Kong. I can't just stuff the Kong really full and give it to a puppy because if the puppy can't get it out, it's going to get bored really quickly. Yeah. So little well, tips like, you know, put, put really simple things in the Kong so that when the puppy tips it over, it all falls out. Yeah. And it just goes, wow, you know, this toy gives me loads of reinforcement. OK, and slowly, slowly over the weeks, you're going to get it a little bit harder and a little bit harder. Chicken, big lumps of chicken won't fall out quite so much, you know, but it will come out. And then we're building up to doing a stuffed Kong once the dog's kind of committed to the toy. So, you know, other treat based toys like little balls that you roll around that get treats out. And I'll sit there, you know, teaching the puppy how to do that. It's a little bit I like to use the analogy, you know, how many hours what might you sit down and play Lego with your kids before you can leave it as an entertainment that they do on their own so you can get on with your chores? Probably hours and hours and hours. So by giving them that kind of time, and I think if they have definite kind of slots of attention, then they're not looking for that kind of attention because some of it could be a little bit kind of, well, I'm bored, I'm just going to come and irritate mummy. And then look, I chew her laces and she puts her hands down and she does things with me, which can be potentially just, you know, reinforcing them having attention, kind of turning it into games and things like that. So I think start getting your puppy into some 
constructed games that can be used for kind of self-entertainment later on. So when I give you this ball now full of treats, that keeps you busy for 10 minutes while I'm on the on, on the telephone. So that again, I'm not building up any kind of, oh, when mum's on the telephone, I'm going to start biting her ankles because there's very little she can do about it and I can get away with it. My puppies used to, um, it started happening when I was on Zoom calls. Um, I bred them during um, COVID. Um, and so we were doing a lot of Zoom lessons and they learned that mummy would give them kind of this funny attention and try and wave her hands under the desk and get her off the wires. So initially I tried taping all the wires up and puppy proofing it. Of course, then they loved biting at the tape. It was a better game. It took longer to get all the tape off and the wires. And to be fair, they were pretty good in everyday situations, but they'd learned in this situation, mummy's not giving me attention. So I soon had to kind of think about, well, how, how do I manage that time differently to kind of stop that kind of process happening mm -hmm. uh, and stop creating kind of a pattern? So as well as taping up the wires, we had all sorts of entertainment going on in the room um, so that that was the last thing that was of interest to them um, and they had lots of other kind of interesting kind of things to do you know I think we you know when you've got a child you usually have a playroom there's lots of toys in it and I think you know people don't change things up enough for dogs um, I remember doing one kind of Zoom session where I had this whole room full of kind of tents and tunnels and cardboard boxes and ball pits and, you know, just, you know, a puppy kind of play zone, really. Um, and I would spend a lot of time playing with them in that play zone so that they liked it so that then I could, you know, on my Zoom call, I could more or less set up different things in the room and they, they were happy to do that on their own because I'd spent that time with them doing it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great um, point to just emphasise. Um, don't take it for granted that <clears throat> your puppy's going to know how to play with those interactive tools or toys. It's down to you to to create that pattern. And also variety. Keep changing it up. You can use cardboard boxes that you get from, you know, your Amazon delivery and, and use those as toys. You know, toilet rolls, they can be toys. You know, um, anything like that that's safe and obviously uh, uh, that you, you collect, use them as toys, stuff them with food, tape them up, let the puppy have at it. So the puppy is learning to uh, interact with things, one, to self-entertain, two, it's expelling mental energy, three, there's a physical entity to it as well. So there's loads to gain. And that's that's going to deter your puppy from biting you. So have if there's situations where you know that your puppy, you know, you sit on the floor and you know your puppy's going to um, automatically jump on you, have those things ready so that you can, as soon as you sit down the floor, pop one of those down, uh, praise the dog for interacting with it and make it a bit interesting so you're redirecting them and also educating them what you want them to do. Um, yeah. So just some thoughts there about sleep patterns and also puppy biting. I'm not sure if anybody has any questions on either of those topics. Feel free to add them in the comments and we'll pick them up. So, um, Di, in terms of puppies and sleep patterns, puppy biting, is there anything else that you see that people make um, consistent mistakes with um, uh, that can create either of those? So that can create puppy biting or they make mistakes when it comes to sleep patterns. Anything that you've noted? Um, I think sometimes when people at work, I think they have that kind of guilt that, you know, I've put you in the crate from nine to 12. And, you know, that does seem like a kind of long time. And I come home at kind of, you know, lunchtime and I spend an hour and a half with you. Uh, and then maybe you're in the crate from one to half past three when someone gets home again. Um, and then when everyone's home at half past three, they leave the puppy out for the whole evening because they feel, well, he was crated for three hours and he was crated for another hour and a half. So we feel a bit mean crating them. So from half past three till kind of, you know, 10 o'clock at night, that they're, they're keeping the puppy kind of out of that area. And I think without anything, again, we've talked about without anything constructive to do. So I, I, you know, a puppy, depending on the age of the puppy, you know, I know as a breeder that my puppies are sleeping about 20, 18 to 20 hours per 24 hours when they leave at eight weeks old. And obviously that time's going to increase. So I think with my puppies, you know, or my collie puppies, probably at eight weeks old, I'm kind of 45, 50 minutes awake, then they have a nap. Um, and then they're out again and then they have a nap and then they're out again and that cycles all throughout the day um, even right up till bedtime so they may have had a sleep from 8 to 10 and then I get them out from 10 to 11 I'm going to bed at 11 and then I take them up to, to bed with me so I think you know if you've got an 8, 9, 10 week old puppy that's been awake for 4 hours um, they're going to be you know mental by then there's just too much learning going on and you I think appreciating the learning that go, goes on you know even learning to go over the step or learning to negotiate something in the house or you know seeing that new person I don't think people see that as a big thing because we take our world for granted 
Um, mm -hmm. And they're big learning experiences for puppies. There's so much learning going on. Give them that downtime to process the learning. And whether you, obviously, we talk about on the course, you know, whether you're going to use crate training, whether you're going to use a pen, whether you're just going to create a kind of safe room for the puppy to be in, um, then it's just being able to give them that downtime to kind of process that so that then they're, they're not just, you know, firing up and I think you know a lot of people will read that kind of you know say a loud ouch when they bite you and things like that and I really find that my clients you know you say ouch and the puppy backs off for a minute and whoa, it comes back at you okay and that's the sign of an overtired puppy you know yes you've just added a little bit of anxiety in, into the equation um but most puppies I do I do get that answer from all of my clients um maybe it's because they're not maybe using ouch in the right place because I think Sometimes it can work effectively if you exactly know what you're doing, but I think most people find that absolutely ineffective and causes kind of the dog to just come back and kind of bite a bit harder. So I would say stay away from those kind of techniques um, and just try and manage your puppy's time effectively. Mm, yeah, and I think the other thing is that you could potentially be making the, do the dog um, noise sensitive. You know, you're actually yeah. conditioning them to be concerned about a noise, which in that moment, okay, it stops the biting. Then, you know, one of your kids you know, runs through the house and, and you know, just makes a loud noise out of its skin because it goes oh my god am i in trouble and that you can that can be really really impactful so you know i think if you've got sensitive dogs absolutely those kind of sensitive dogs too but i think yeah so i'd be very careful about using those techniques absolutely. just try and make their wake time really constructive really good learning taking place and just try and get a good baseline for your puppy's normal behavior and what are the signs of overtiredness you know do yeah. they start doing unusual things like they're chewing the table leg now they never used to chew the table yeah. You know, and that's maybe they're getting restless. They don't know what to do with themselves. It's like that overtired two-year-old, isn't it? That yeah. start, starts kind of kicking off and you know they need a sleep. So it's having that kind of downtime place where you can, you know, put them away to recharge their batteries before definitely. another period of learning starts. Absolutely, definitely. And I think, you know, it's being mindful of um, not letting them get, um, you know, overstimulated in that time, you know, depending on what they're doing in that in that time. That uh, I, As I said yesterday, yesterday or early in the week I'm quite you know uh cautious about what my puppies do I don't like them saying for example running around headlessly getting themselves all hyped up um it's not my personal choice I'd rather be interacting with them or you know rehearsing good behavior in the house of course puppies are going to be puppies that's not a problem but I don't want them for example you know running around with my other dogs in the garden for an hour 15 minutes because then they're tired and then because that's just conditioning them to come out be all hyped up excited and then you're going to get on the loop as well and I, I, I think I, that's I, something I, that people can mistake actually is when the puppy's getting that kind of overtired they almost get hyper hyper don't they and I think a lot of people over mistake that for uh, mistake it for they need more stimulation they need more exercise and you know I will get a lot of clients reporting to me. I know they shouldn't be walked for an hour, but if I take him for an hour's walk of a night, oh, he settles down so, so much better. Um, or they get the toy out and start playing with them when they're in that hyperactive kind of mode. Whereas probably if I noticed that my puppy was getting a little bit overtired, you know, just doing some calmer food training where you're, you know, you're just getting you know, a little bit more kind of thinking going on, not that they can think great in that kind of state, but just some search games, just put them into seeking mode and doing some little search games and things like that, rather than bringing out the toys and buzzing them up more, because that's going to be stimulate them more and it's going to be harder for you to get them to sleep. So how do I bring that arousal level down enough for the puppy to actually, you know, go to sleep rather than let's go up and up and up and up and up till they crash. Um, and then they're kind of asleep for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, absolutely. It's just being mindful. And the, the thing is, you don't want your puppy in the short term, for example, if you have a puppy and I absolutely get, oh, just let him, you know, play with the other dogs. That will tire him out. And great. And now I can have an easy, peaceful evening. I understand the short term reason behind that. But the long term is that one what you're doing is you're emphasizing to that puppy that that other dog is a real massive draw. They can provide them with enrichment and engagement that you probably can't or that in comparison to you, the draw of the other dog is more appealing. Well, fast track six months down the line, your dog now is very drawn to other dogs. Now you have another issue to fix, all because of the pattern that the dogs learn. So it's really, whilst it can appear to have a short term <coughs> gain, the long term ramifications of fallout can be can, um, can bite you in the backside. So just bear that in mind. So any other final points to add on sleep patterns or puppy biting, Di? 
Not really. I think we've we've covered a lot there, and um, and it goes through a very kind of um, you know it goes through the process. There's all sorts of kind of tips in there to kind of help you, particularly kind of around children on the course and biting of the children, because I think that you know people can find a problem. And about you know not establishing patterns. You know the kids come down. The puppy's got this emotion connected to the kids are really exciting. So the minute they come down, it's hanging off their pajamas. So think about how you can change the pattern. You know you may introduce a little pattern. Con time means you know a treat based toy in the kitchen so we're going to announce that and give them that as the children are coming down so that we're beginning to get a calmer kind of response to those children coming in so think about you know the patterns and the emotions that you may be connecting to those patterns by your daily activities you know what emotions you may be causing and, and what problems and what behaviors you're seeing that are a problem to you and then change those patterns to have a, something more effective in place to manage yeah, absolutely. and that's hopefully what the course is teaching you. I, I do find that a lot of my clients actually come to me with their own answers, um, which are very effective answers. So I think something that the course teaches you is to is to think dog. Yeah, and once you can kind of think dog a little bit more, you're going to be able to come up with your own answers and own solutions to kind of help you. It doesn't always mean you, you've got good mechanical skills yet for dog training. I think that takes a long time to master. Um, and just the, yeah, I, I would say, you know, the more you can learn to kind of think of, the, the more you're going to be ahead of the game. Yeah, rather that's than micro managing. Yeah, that's such a great point. So I'm just going to share the link up again. It's trainwithmarker.com forward slash up up. That is such a great point. The beauty of the course that actually teaches you to see the world from the dog's perspective and to think dog, which then opens up a plethora of solutions and techniques that you never even knew you could come up with to fix the things that puppies present to you as challenges. So stacks of information in there. Sign up for the course. As I said, the course is now going to be open indefinitely. Um, and if you use one of our affiliate vouchers, uh, sorry, uh, uh, codes, you can get a discount, uh, either mine or Dye's. Um, you can get a great discount on the course, which makes it, again, affordable uh, and um, it's worth every penny. It's not a, we, we've deliberately kept it at a really affordable cost because we want people to subscribe to the content and to improve the life of their puppies. If you know somebody with a puppy, if you're getting a puppy. Yeah. If a family member's getting a puppy, gift the course to them. That'd be a great thing. And if you know of anybody in your community that would benefit <coughs> benefit from the course, share the link with them, get them to sign up. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we can start to help more people with puppies. From me and from Di, thank you for listening. Uh, tomorrow our conversation is about, let me just check. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so to do with early walks, is it? Am I yes, it's first, first outings and recall cues. So that will be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So join us if you can. If you pick this up in the various places where it's shared, post your questions, just tag me in it or tag Diane in it, and we will answer your questions. First outings, recall cues tomorrow, 10 a.m. Look forward to sharing that with you. See you all later.